Okay, class. So uh, I'm going to start chapter 9 now, which is on differential equations. So the very first section that we're going to be doing is section 9.1, which is modeling with differential equations. So I want you to recall what a differential equation is. We have done these before in Math 60, some very basic ones. So let's recall a differential equation. Is an equation containing an unknown function and some of its derivatives. So what does it mean to solve a differential equation? Well, the unknown in, in a differential equation is the function. So to solve a differential equation, and by the way, so that I don't have to keep writing differential equation, I'm going to be using the abbreviation DE, okay? So to solve a differential equation means to find the unknown function that makes the differential equation true. So differential equations, as well as uh, integrating, always introduce a constant of integration. So a solution to a differential equation will always have a constant of integration unless the differential equation is what we call an initial value problem. Let's go ahead and underline this. which I abbreviate IVP. This is also called a boundary value problem. So what is an initial value problem? Um, let's move on to the next slide here. An initial value problem is a special type of differential equation, okay? It's a differential equation where a function value is given at a particular point.
So importantly, guys, solutions to an IVP have no constant of integration. Okay. So we, because this is our first time seeing differential equations in any sort of serious context, um, I, we need to talk about what it means to have a particular order. So the order of a differential equation is the order of the highest order derivative that appears. in the differential equation. Okay, so this is what it means to have an order of a differential equation. We are basically going to be studying first order differential equations in this class. Um, higher order ones can get very complicated. Okay, so um, let's just do a practice problem here. This will be our example one. I want us to solve the differential equation and the differential equation is going to be y prime is equal to sine x minus x to the fourth. Now I'm asking you to solve a differential equation but I haven't actually told you how to do that. However if we look at this differential equation we notice that if we want to find an unknown function whose derivative is sine x minus x to the fourth, all we need to do is integrate, right? So this implies that y is equal to the integral of sine x minus x to the fourth. We are talking about an indefinite integral here. What does this equal? Well, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And the antiderivative of x to the fourth is one fifth x to the fifth, and then we have a plus c there. So y y of x equals negative cos x minus one fifth x to the fifth plus c is the solution to the differential equation. Okay. So um, obviously differential equations can get a lot more complicated. You can do this when there are no y's on the right side. However, as soon as you have y's there, everything changes. Okay. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and do a more tricky problem. But before I do it, I just want to write out one thing. Um, we can always check if something is a solution by taking a derivative, plugging the function in wherever you see a y, and checking that the equation is actually true. So to check if a function solves a differential equation, Take the function y and as many derivatives as necessary in order to see if plugging the 
these into the differential equation forms a true statement. So this is how you check if something is a solution. And note, for IVPs, to check if a function solves it, make sure you also check that the initial condition. What do I mean by initial condition? This is the function value is also true. Okay, so for IVPs there are actually two things to check. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and do some examples here. So we are on number two. I want us to show that the following function, y of x is equal to 2 thirds e to the x plus e to the negative 2x is a solution to the differential equation y prime equals negative 2y plus 2e to the x. So we are checking, okay, understand what we're doing here. We're checking that this function right here, this function, this is the guy that we're checking to see if it solves the differential equation right here. Now you'll notice that this differential equation has a y prime in it, and it also has a y in it. And so we are gonna need to plug in y and also take its derivative and plug y prime in over there. So let's go ahead and do that. We need to find the derivative first. So what would y prime be? Looking at the function, it is 2 thirds e to the x, and then using the chain rule, we have minus 2e to the negative 2x. So plugging, okay, into the differential equation. So on the left side, we have y prime. Um, which is 2 thirds e to the x minus 2 e to the negative 2 x, okay? Oh, just to give a uh, picture of what we're doing here, we're taking this function and replacing y with it, and we're also taking this guy right here, and we're replacing y prime with it. And we're going to see if the two sides are the same. So. On the left, we get that, and on the right, we don't know if they're equal yet. This is what we're trying to find out. We're gonna do negative two times y plus two e to the x. So are these the same? We're not sure yet. We actually need to multiply the right side out and see if they are the same. So this becomes negative four thirds e to the x minus 2 e to the negative 2 x plus 2 e to the x and now we're going to combine like terms 2 e to the x and negative 4 thirds 2 minus 4 thirds that's the same as 6 thirds minus 4 thirds which is 2 thirds so the right side becomes 2 thirds e to the x minus 2 e to the negative 2 x we notice that this guy and this guy are the same. So yes, y of x 
is a solution. Okay. So this is how you show that a function is a solution to a differential equation. Let's do an initial value problem now so you guys can get an idea of how that works. So this will be number uh, three. Let's show that y of t equals negative t cosine t minus t is a solution to the IVP. So what is the IVP? The IVPs always have two parts to them. First we have t times dy dt equals y plus t squared sine of t and then we also have the initial condition y of pi equals zero. This is our first time seeing it, so I just want to show you guys that an IVP always has two parts. This is the actual differential equation, and then this part right here is called the initial condition. Right? So we need to check that both of these things are true. Um, let's call uh, checking the uh, differential equation this is part one and we're going to call this guy part two. So let's start by checking part one. To do that, you notice that we do have a dy dt in here. So that means I'm going to have to take a derivative of my function. So what is y prime of t equal to? Let's go ahead and take that derivative. Uh, we actually have to use the product rule. So it's going to be the derivative of the first times the second plus the first, so that's minus t, times the derivative of the second. And then we have this, which is the same as negative cosine t um, plus t sine t minus one. So this is my y prime. What I have here, this guy right here, I'm going to have to plug into this. Also, I'm going to need to plug this guy right here. So if I do that, I end up with the following. t times dy dt, which is negative cosine t plus t sine t minus 1 is that equal to now on the right side of the differential equation I have y plus t squared sine t so it's going to be y plus t squared sine t Are these two things the same? Let's actually multiply the t out on the left side. So if I actually multiply this by those three terms, I end up with the following. Negative t cosine t plus t squared sine t minus t. And you notice that this is the same as the right side. Um, right? The order of subtraction or addition does not matter, right? So it works. We do need to also check the initial condition though. How do you read this initial condition? So if we come over to here, I want you guys to understand that when you see y of pi equals zero, pi is actually the independent variable. So the way that you're going to take this guy right here, this guy right here means the following. This means that when t equals pi, 
y equals 0. So we need to check that that's actually true for our function. So let's look at our function. What is y of pi equal to? Um, this is negative pi times cosine of pi minus pi. What is this equal to? Well, that's negative pi times cosine of pi is negative 1 minus pi, which is equal to pi minus pi, which is 0, so it works. So we just showed, so this implies that y of t is a solution to the IVP. Okay, so let's talk about how differential equations can be used to model certain real life phenomena. So differential equations are very useful for modeling functions in nature. And the reason is, since a lot of times in nature, it is often easy to see how something grows. As a rate. Now what, what I mean is it's easier to see something grow versus what it actually equals. You can figure out its growth rate as opposed to what it equals at certain times. Um, of course, sort of a common sense note to consider, because we're about to look at several models. Um, something important is that every model depends on your assumptions. Okay, the more you assume, the more complicated the model. And so what we're going to look at specifically are models of population growth. How do populations grow? So model number one is called the law of natural growth. And you may remember this from Calculus 2 when you learn Newton's Law of Cooling or things like that. Okay, So what we're going to say is we're going to let P of T be the population. Some population, it doesn't have to be people, it could be any population. Population at time T. So of course, something to keep in mind here is that this is a positive function because population can never be negative. So p is greater than 0 for all t. Um, I guess I should say greater than or equal to 0 since population could be 0. So what is the law of natural growth? The law of natural growth says that the rate of change of a population is 
proportional to its current population. Um, this is often how disease spreads as well. So what this means is that the more people there are, the faster the population grows. Okay, we can all understand that, especially when you think about something like rabbits. Rabbit populations grow really, really, really fast, and we've had um, some things in nature go haywire because of this fact. So let's look at this a little bit more. What does it mean for the rate of change of a population to be proportional to its current population value? Okay, what this means, remember, for something to be proportional, it means it's equal to k times that thing. So what this means is that dp dt, which is the rate of change of the population, is directly proportional to its population value. So that would be written like this dp dt is equal to k times p. Okay. Let's go on to the next slide here. We're going to look at this a little more closely. Sorry, that is a t. I'm not sure why my t's look like f's sometimes. There we go. Now, what can we say about if k is positive? If k is positive, remember that p is positive as well, right? So p is positive, right? So if k is positive, then that means you're multiplying two positives together, and you get that dp dt is positive. Then... dp dt is greater than zero, which means that p is increasing. The population is growing. Okay? If k is negative, then you're multiplying a negative times a positive, so dp dt is negative. What does it mean for a derivative to be negative? It means that p is decreasing. Um, decreasing. Another word for increasing here is growing, and another word for decreasing is decaying. A lot of times these are called the law of natural growth and the law of natural decay. So what function works? What function solves this differential equation, right? This guy right here is a differential equation. We would like to know what function works. Well, okay, let's actually rewrite it. This is actually an IVP. The IVP that we're talking about can be written like this. We know that dp dt is equal to k times p. And we also know that p of 0, we're going to call that p naught. Okay, so what is a solution? We don't know where this comes from yet, but the solution is p of t is equal to p naught e to the k t. Let's go ahead and check that. Now remember, to check that something is a solution, we're going to need to check both of these conditions. So let's call this guy condition 1, and let's call this guy condition 2. So let's check condition 1 first. What is the derivative? Uh, let's go ahead and write that down. Uh, P prime is equal to. Um, chain rule here, we've got k p naught e to the k t. So if we plug it into both sides of 1, 
we end up with k p naught e to the k t is that equal to k times remember we also have to take this guy and we need to plug it in here for p and see if the right side equals the same thing and yes it does right the two sides are exactly the same so it works right so i'm gonna go ahead and mark this off it does work now what about condition two condition two we need to check that p of zero is actually p naught using the function so what's p of zero equal to i'm just going to plug zero in isn't that p naught e to the k times zero but e to the zero is one so this is just p naught so it works okay now what does this function look like? Before we move on, we've got ourselves a function, right? So this means that the law of natural growth says that P of T is equal to whatever the initial population is times E to the K T. We know what an exponential looks like, right? So if we're looking at it, this is what we're talking about. If this is a function of time and this is a function, or sorry, if... Uh, if our x-axis or our t-axis here, this is time, and this is p of t, right? Then we've got p naught here, and then this grows. This is what exponential growth looks like. And so what does this mean? This means that p grows forever and it skyrockets into the sky. p grows forever. Is this realistic? Well, do populations grow forever in real life? The answer, of course, is no. This is a very simplistic model, but as we know, when populations grow and grow and grow, all of a sudden, things might happen, right? Um, resources run out. Space runs out. Etc. So this is not necessarily a realistic model. So we are going to learn a second model right now, which works a little bit better. So this is model number two called the logistic model. Now, what we assume for this model is we assume that there is a maximum capacity, right? So suppose we have a maximum capacity, M. This has a name, guys. This is called the carrying capacity. Okay, carrying capacity. Here's what we want. So we want the following. If P is much less than M, in other words, if our population is much, much smaller than the carrying capacity, then what we want is for dp dt to be approximately k times p. What we're saying is we want the law of natural growth to apply when we have plenty of resources to feed the population. We're nowhere near the carrying capacity. However, here's what else we want, right? We want for when the population starts to get close to M, 
So as P approaches M, what we want is for dp dt to approach zero, right? We want it to slow down. What do we want for, or what do we want to happen if p is bigger than m? So what does this mean? This means there's more, uh, the population is greater than the carrying capacity. Well, then by definition, things, uh, the population should shrink. This means that dp dt should be less than zero. Okay, so what we are looking for then, what we're looking for is a function that satisfies all three of these conditions, or rather a differential equation that satisfies all three of these conditions. So the solution or the differential equation that we're going to use is as follows. Let's look at this a little bit, okay? So I want to describe what happens. If, let's see if all three of these conditions are met. If P is much less than M, well, let's actually go to another slide so I can examine this a little bit better, okay? So remember, we have dp dt is equal to k times p times 1 minus p over m. So let's see if all three of those conditions are met. First off, if p is a lot less than m, what that means is that the fraction p over m right, then p over m is close to zero, which implies that dp dt will just be close to k times p, right? Look at the equation above. If p over m is close to zero, then that means that dp dt is basically kp. What happens if P gets close to M? If P gets close to M, then P over M is approximately one, and plug in one up there, doesn't that mean you get zero? DP DT is a close to zero. And finally, if P is bigger than M, what happens? Well, this means that 1 minus p over m, if p is bigger than m, then this means that this guy is negative, and so you're multiplying a negative times a positive, this means that dp dt is negative. And so this works. We actually have what we call, so if we were to draw a picture of it, it looks like this, right? So if this is the carrying capacity, what we're saying is that wherever our population starts, it grows, but then it shrinks. Or not shrinks, but it approaches M and the rate shrinks. Or if it starts up here, then it approaches there. We also have two what we call equilibrium solutions, meaning that if P naught uh, starts on those, then the population never changes. Um, the two solutions are, the first one is P equals zero. That makes sense, right? If you start down here, you're gonna be down here forever. And your second um, equilibrium solution is P equals M exactly. So if P is exactly equal to M, then your rate of change is zero and you don't change, which makes sense. You will start at the max, you'll be at the max. And so your equilibrium solution looks like this. Okay, that concludes this section. We are going to learn more about these models in section 9.4. So more to come.
regarding these models in 9.4. But first thing we have to do is learn how to actually solve some differential equations, and that's in the next section, 9.3. Thank you so much for watching.